Now think again about our normal endotherms like birds and mammals. Uh, and realizing that the costs of endothermy are so great, uh, we have a couple of pretty clear expectations. First, we would expect endotherms to be reducing this enormous cost of endothermy through a variety of adaptations that have occurred along these animals' evolutionary pasts. Okay. Second, expect endothermy to evolve only when these considerable costs can be met and exceeded by whatever advantages are gained as a result of this endothermy. Okay. You know, if we think about the diversity of animals, you could ask, well, why is it that only mammals and birds have become endothermic and pretty much everybody else is ectothermic? Now, I think the answer should be relatively obvious that there are a lot of situations in which the costs of elevating one's body temperature are far greater than what the animal can afford given their caloric budget. You have to be able to meet the caloric requirements of endothermy, and then some, in order for endothermy to be worth your while. And so coming back to number one, minimizing one's heat loss can be achieved through a number of different mechanisms. The first, and maybe the easiest of these, is simply to be large. Now this is related to the phenomenon we sometimes call gigantothermy. And the general idea here is that the bigger you are, the less relative surface area you have to lose body temperature. Now apart from gigantothermy, there are a couple of other possibilities. Now there are a few different mechanisms one could use to retain the heat that you spent so many calories producing. And the other possibility is to actually allow your body temperature to drop, to become cold either locally in parts of your body or temporarily, as in overnight or uh, over the period of a long winter. And so we'll be discussing a few mechanisms along these lines in turn. And so one of the most obvious ways of retaining heat that you're probably familiar with is the concept of insulation. And while pretty much everybody understands the concept of insulation, or at least in an applied sort of situation, we all put on insulating layers after all. Uh, there's some physics-y issues that need to be discussed before we move further. Uh, in order to understand insulation, you kind of have to understand the ways in which hot bodies lose heat to their colder environments. Okay? But one of the principal ways in which we have the transfer of energy from hot to cold is via electromagnetic radiation. Okay? Hot bodies tend to radiate heat to colder bodies and that occurs as a result of infrared rays that are emitted from warmer bodies. I mean, if, if anybody who's familiar with the technology of infrared cameras uh, is basically accustomed to the idea that warm bodies emit infrared radiation, which can then be picked up by a device. Now, the reason why insulation works is that this transfer, this radiation uh, from a hot body to a cold environment, it only occurs at the very surface of the body. So if we have a cold surface and a cold environment, the amount of radiative heat loss would be very low, or maybe even non-existent. And so if you take a warm animal like, like a chicken, so if I were to take all the feathers off of one of my chickens, it would be pretty pathetic. Okay? But it would also be really warm to the touch. Uh, body temperatures of birds are typically in the area of 40 to 42 degrees Celsius, which is like uh, considerably warmer than your body temperature. Large warm-blooded mammals typically have body temperatures around what we have at 37 degrees Celsius. Birds and other smaller mammal species tend to have higher body temperatures, like around 40 degrees. So if you were to touch a live plucked chicken, it would, be, it would feel really warm. There'd be lots of heat that would be lost from this bird. But because of the layers of feathers, what we've done is put a layer of very, very poor conducting material. Okay, Feathers trap air. That's the whole idea of feathers. It's also true of fur to hair. It's basically trapping air inside of that coat. And so by having all this air trapped right up against the hot body, there's very little heat that's conducting through that layer of trapped air, so the outside layer that's actually exposed to the outer world is kind of cold. Okay, So if I, you know, when I touch my birds, so when you touch my birds on the outside, the outside layer of their feathers is cold. Uh, it's not that the bird is cold, but the outside layer is cold, and as a result of having this cool exterior, there's relatively little heat loss. And this is a general idea of insulation. A poor conductor material covering the bird, the outside of the insulation is totally cold and therefore we dramatically reduce radiative heat loss. So insulation is one mechanism, it's a pretty easy one to understand. Okay, 
There's another one that's kind of along the same vein. And, uh, and, and th for this one, you have to kind of extend the legs from a bird out. In, in other words, instead of this being a chicken, we're going to make it like a wading bird, maybe a heron. And so the uh, legs of a typical heron are, are longer. Okay, um, the, uh, the bottom part of the leg is entirely featherless. And uh, this, this wading bird sticks its feet into water. And so the, uh, the, the bottom portion of the bird, the, the, the feet and the lower leg of the bird, is very frequently submerged in icy cold water. And so while the water might be 4 degrees Celsius, really cold, the body temperature of the bird, on the other hand, is more close to 40 degrees Celsius. And so we've got this, we've, we've got this conflict. We've got, to, we've got to move blood out from the body of the bird down to the foot. After all, the feet need oxygen and nutrients. And uh, that blood has got to return back to the body of the bird. And in the absence of any adaptive mechanism for preserving body temperature, we would expect that the uh, circulation of blood out to the foot of a waiting bird would present a huge liability when it comes to uh, maintaining body temperature for this bird. Okay? But it doesn't have to be that way. Okay? We, we know that birds... Uh, legs are relatively poorly insulated, so if we sort of draw this picture, this, this bird's leg a little bit bigger. So here's the uh, top portion of the bird's leg, and here's the bottom portion of the bird's leg going all the way down to the, the foot. Right? So the feet are down here. And down here in the foot, we've got cold uh, body temperatures up here in the body. We're comparatively warm. Uh, roughly 40 degrees Celsius would be the, the blood that's circulating down the leg through the arteries arterial blood carrying oxygen, O2 rich blood is going down the leg, O2 poor venous blood is going to be coming back from the foot icy cold, and the effect of the circulation would tend to, to chill the body because we're introducing lots of cold blood to the warm body, as well as heat the foot, which in which case the foot is immediately going to lose all that heat because it's very poorly insulated. And So here's where I introduce this general mechanism of counter current heat exchange. Because the vascular structure, the vascular structures we have in the leg of the bird don't look like this. We don't have a simple venous return of cold blood back up to the warm body of the, of the bird. Instead, what happens is that the, uh, the venous blood kind of wraps around the artery. So if here we've got the arterial blood carrying oxygen-rich blood down to the foot of the bird. The venous blood coming back, okay, the venous blood coming back up the bird doesn't take a direct route. It basically takes a circuitous route. The vein splits up into a network of venules which wrap really closely around the artery and, uh, and take the circuitous route. And so by the time it gets to the, to the top, it's been preheated. It, it's, it's warm. It's been warmed up to maybe 39 degrees Celsius. At the same time that the venous blood is warmed, the arterial blood has lost all of its heat, so it gets down to the icy cold foot of the bird pre-chilled to a chilly 6 degrees Celsius. In other words, uh, as a result of this countercurrent heat exchange mechanism, we, we minimize heat loss from the feet of the bird because the feet of the bird stay cold all the time. Now this anatomical feature, this network, visible network of venules surrounding the arteries is called a rete mirabile. Rete means network, mirabile means visible. And so this is a clear anatomical structure that we can find. It's, it, if, if, we, if we were to dissect a bird and find a structure like this, it would be kind of difficult to understand. But then you, then you put the bird into its ecological context. You take that more holistic view of what the bird is and what the bird does. And if you realize that the bird has got to keep its feet in icy cold water, this reta mirabile all of a sudden makes a huge amount of sense. The bird's Hot arterial blood is cooled so that we minimize the amount of heat loss from its very cold feet. Okay, now a neat twist on the story comes back up to the, the tuna. Because when we think about the tuna, its circulation is kind of similar. We have arterial blood that's coming up from the heart. Okay, so the, the, the heart is pumping blood forward. It goes through the gill arches, right? It goes through the gill arches until it gets to the dorsal aorta. And from the dorsal aorta, it has to travel out to the rest of the fish. And when it comes out, the rest of the fish, it, co it goes right along the outside of the fish out here, right? Uh, same thing on the other side. We have a dorsal aorta on the, on the left side of the fish, and it goes out along the flanks of the fish. It carries the blood backwards. Right? Now, this oxygen-rich blood is going to be at the same temperature as the water because uh, as it passes through the gill arches, it's moving very close to the water that's moving through the fish's mouth and out the gills. And so the water moves in that direction. It transfers oxygen 
over to the blood and also by the time the blood reaches the dorsal aorta it's going to be at the same temperature as the, as the water in other words cold and so here we've got cold oxygenated blood that has to move inwards to the middle portion of the fish because that's where the oxygen is going to be consumed all this red muscle on the interior of the fish is going to be oxygen hungry at the same time we're going to have venous blood returning back to the heart. The deoxygenated blood from that musculature eventually has to make its way back to the heart and it's going to do so similarly along the outside flanks. And so the venous blood has to return back from this middle portion of the fish to the outside and it's going to be running parallel and the opposite direction relative to the arterial blood. Okay? And so if you were to look at this area right here you would see the hot O2 poor blood running in one direction towards the outside of the fish, while the cold O2 rich blood is running towards the middle of the fish from that dorsal aorta. And uh, these blood vessels run completely counter parallel to each other, counter current. Oh, remember counter? That means in opposite directions. Counter current means in opposite directions. In the case of the bird's legs, the venous blood and the arterial blood running in opposite directions. Here we see venous blood and arterial blood running in opposite directions. I guess the difference here is that in the case of the bird, the temperature profiles are exactly the opposite. The O2 poor blood is cold coming back to the body of the bird. The, uh, the, the O2 rich blood is warm and coming out of the bird. And so it's kind of the opposite in terms of which blood is cold and warm, but it's pretty much the same idea. You would also call this structure a reta mirabile, and it is also visible if you ever have the opportunity to fillet a tuna. Okay, I've done this myself. It's actually pretty neat. There's a, there's a, there's a strip of tuna meat along each fillet in which you have these blood vessels running exactly opposite of each other. It kind of looks like this when you see it. Okay. You've got a whole bunch of blood vessels and they're running side by side and you've got this thing that runs entirely from the outside to the inside portion of the fish and it's exactly like you learn about in Bio 202. And so we could call we can call countercurrent heat exchange both a mechanism to uh, allow animals to retain heat. It's also doing this other thing. It's also allowing animals to locally drop their body temperature, which results in less heat loss. Okay? To a certain extent, we do exactly the same thing every time we get a little bit cold and our hands and feet get chilly. So in the case of a human, I'll draw a human over here. Oops. Uh, no beak. Okay, There's no beak on a human. right? But uh, I'm going to draw it anyways like this. And so in the case of a human, here are the arms. Here's the other arm. It's going to go in the other direction. Okay. Here's the back of the animal. Okay. Here's the uh, here's the rear. Okay. So, so I'm drawing the human facing away from us here. The feet. There's one foot. There's the other foot. Okay. So in the case of a human, we've got we've got liabilities in these extremities. The arms and the legs are liabilities when it comes to heat loss. Okay. That's where you've got the greatest amount of surface area. The parts of the body that absolutely need to retain the heat are the internal viscerae, the hearts, the lungs, the intestines, and, and the brain. Okay? These are the areas that are kind of like, they're, they're non-negotiable when it comes to allowing body temperature to drop. Out here in these extremities, okay, I hate to say it, but all we've got there is skeletal muscle. And skeletal muscle operates pretty well even under colder conditions. Okay? And so, uh, and so one thing that we do all the time is to modulate the flow of blood. We've got our heart here. The heart normally pumps blood up to the brain. It pumps the blood out to the left arm, pumps blood out to the right arm, pumps blood through all of our internal organs. It pumps blood out to the left leg. It pumps blood out to the right leg. And which of, the, which of these are absolutely necessary? The parts of the circulation that go to the viscerae as well as to the, the brain. Okay. Uh, the skeletal muscles, these are negotiable. And so when your hypothalamus detects that the body temperature is getting a little bit too cold, what it will do, in addition to elevating the uh, tension of skeletal muscle, it'll also kind of restrict circulation out to the arms and restrict circulation out to the legs. Okay, And, the, and what that does is uh, it allows the, the arms and legs to get a little bit cooler and 
it maintains, basically allows more of the heat to stay where it's really needed in the area of the brain and the body temperature. This is actually related to a general phenomenon that we call the mammalian dive reflex. And this happens when we jump into the water. And you know, one of the consequences of reducing blood flow out to the arms and the legs is that the total amount of blood that's circulated by the, by the cardiovascular system is reduced. So it can be reduced by, by about a half. And so if you don't need to circulate five liters of blood, if you're only circulating 2.5 liters of blood to the viscera in the brain, then your heart doesn't need to beat as fast. Okay? And so one thing that happens when this occurs is that the heart rate, the overall cardiac rate, starts to drop. Uh, you know, there's a demonstration that is uh, that used to be done all the time. We're not allowed to do it anymore. But in this demonstration, you hook up a student with a heart rate monitor, and then you dip the student into a bath of icy water. And what immediately happens is that the circulation of the arms and legs drops to nothing, and the overall volume of blood circulating is dramatically diminished, and the heart rate goes from like 70 beats a minute down to 30 beats a minute. Now another mechanism of temporarily dropping body temperature is something that we see in hummingbirds. Um, hummingbirds are, are, are little birds, obviously. And you think you know what a hummingbird looks like. It's, it's like a very small chicken. It's got uh, wings that, that beat rapidly. They beat incredibly fast. And they go around from flower to flower. And, and if you think about a hummingbird, its metabolic rate has got to be ridiculous. It's got to be crazy high. Right? So, and, and it's true. Uh, small birds, small animals have very high metabolic rates. They've got small body sizes, so they can't really have that much insulation. Okay. And, and because they've got high metabolic rates, their temperature tends to be really high. If you were to maintain that elevated body temperature throughout the night, for example, when it gets cold, you'd run the risk of starving to death. Seriously, you, you, you wouldn't be able to maintain body temperature overnight if you're a hummingbird on a cold night. Okay. And so what a hummingbird does is it goes through diurnal cycles of high body temperature, low body temperature, high body temperature, low body temperature. During the night, it drops its body temperature to a much lower rate, which allows it to reduce the overall amount of radiative heat loss, and that allows the birds to uh, kind of survive every night. Okay. They're animals that go through long winter sleeps. So if you think about like a chipmunk, a cute little chipmunk that's sleeping in its burrow, it would have a tendency to lose heat by radiative heat loss over this long period of its winter sleep. There's a certain expectable rate of heat loss. Now, chipmunks would kind of run the same type of risk as a hummingbird. Okay? Given a long duration of not eating, a chipmunk would be at risk of starving to death, losing all of its biomass reserves simply for the maintenance of heat. And so one thing that hibernating animals tend to do, especially small ones, they tend to lower their thermostat. They, can, they, they reset their body temperature to a lower level, which allows them to uh, reduce the heat loss during their long winter sleep, and as a result, survive and wake up the next spring without having starved to death. Now, we've already talked about gigantothermy, but putting this into perspective, you might not be surprised to learn that a much larger hibernating animal, even though it's sleeping for the same duration and with the same uh, food deprivation as the chipmunk, something like a bear, that's supposed to be a bear, okay? um, it does not need to adjust its body temperature down to the same degree, I mean, if, if at all. It doesn't need to reduce its body temperature to the same degree as a hibernating chipmunk. Okay. Uh, and, and this would be a, an expression of gigantothermy. Bears having much larger body size have less surface area compared to a chipmunk uh, relative to the overall body volume. It's going to be losing heat at a lower relative rate. Not only that, bears being larger have an opportunity to put on much thicker layers of fur and fat, which allow them to insulate them, their bodies better. Okay. Also related to this idea is the question of whether or not uh, dinosaurs or the non-bird dinosaurs of the Mesozoic were endotherms or ectotherms. Okay. So if you think about something like T-Rex, which compared to a modern chicken would just be huge. So this is a chicken over here. A T-Rex would be enormous. A chicken, being a relatively smaller animal, would need to rely on physiological endothermy to a far greater extent relative to a large-bodied T-Rex. Right? Uh, Tyrannosaurs, for being large, have the same issue going on as bears. Simply being large means that it's going to be losing body heat at a far slower rate compared to a smaller bodied animal like a chicken. Okay. Now on the other hand, we, we, all, we, we do know that uh, dinosaurs, maybe not T-Rex, but there's another tyrannosaur called U-Tyrannus uh, from China which definitely had body feathers. Okay. 
And uh, the fact that these animals had body feathers could suggest that they might have actually been uh, adapted towards maintaining body temperature. It's, it's difficult to tell. I mean, th the other hypothesis was that the feathers uh, of tyrannosaurs and other dinosaurs were serving as sexually selected ornamentations. Uh, there's really, it's really kind of difficult for us to tell. I mean, the other thing about the Mesozoic was that it was pretty warm and there would have been relatively little need to elevate body temperature. I mean, you could rely on ectothermy and elevate your body temperature pretty well that way. Now, this question of whether dinosaurs were or were not warm-blooded brings to mind another study that I remember reading uh, the last 10 years or so, but it had to deal with nose size or the size of an animal's sinus cavity. And the argument kind of goes like this. Okay? There's your nose, okay? and when you inhale, the air passes into a pretty large sinus cavity. There's, there's a pretty large space inside of your face that accommodates the air that you breathe in through your nose. Part of it is related to your olfactory senses. Those, those receptors are up here. But the other thing that happens as the uh, air passes from your nasal cavity down towards your lungs is that it has to move across fairly large islands, okay? large spaces. And there's, it's kind of like a labyrinth. Sometimes we'll have these, these spaces where the air moving in, we're going to have quite a bit of air moving in, the air is going to have a chance to uh, kind of spread out, reduce the rate of flow, it slows down, the air is flowing in different directions. Uh, we have these uh, respiratory, respiratory conchi or turbinates, basically as a result of this slow kind of random movement of air as it passes between the nose and the pharynx where it joins up with the trachea. Okay. We have this area of very slow flow, a slow flow, and this allows air that's inhaled to become humidified and heated, preheated, so the uh, cold air that we might be breathing in on a chilly day is not going to lower our body temperature as much as it would had that air taken a more direct route to the lungs. Okay. It would also be pre-humidified, which is going to create less stress on the lung tissue. Okay. Similarly, yeah, this, this, this area of the sinus cavity will be cooler compared to the rest of the body. And so the air that's exhaled, air coming back out from the lungs, is going to be passing through this slow area of flow in the opposite direction. It's going to be chilled and dehumidified as it passes back out. Okay. And so the result here is a really nice mechanism that is clearly associated with um, not losing heat at a very rapid rate. By having this slow and turbulent flow of air through the sinus cavity, we're able to maintain both body temperature as well as body moisture. You could say that this is a pretty nice adaptation that would go along with endothermy. Okay. The bottom line of the study was that when you look at the skulls of mammals and birds, you see a pretty large sinus cavity. In other words, when you look at the skeletal anatomy of mammals and birds, the sinus cavity checks out pretty nicely. We've got pretty large areas in which we have an opportunity to slow and uh, make more turbulent the flow of air coming into the animal. When you look at a dinosaur skull, on the other hand, I mean, e even though birds are dinosaurs, one of the differences is that birds' sinus cavities are much larger relative to the overall skull size compared to dinosaurs. It seems like dinosaurs didn't have the sinus anatomy that would have allowed for this type of respiratory slowing of air breathed in. On the, on the other hand, it might not have been so necessary during the Mesozoic when we were pretty much dealing with ambient conditions of pretty high humidity and pretty warm temperatures anyways. Okay. Now that's going to do it for the part of this lecture dealing with thermoregulation. We'll be moving next into the topic of circulation and respiration.